Can I cash the hand of the whole? Permission, Mr. Speaker, I would like to address questions 1 and 11 together, as both are related to lower part-time speed limits outside schools. Uh, as Minister responsible for promoting and improving road safety, I want to work actively with partners to reduce death and serious injuries on our roads. I believe the targeted reduction of speed that traffic can travel at, particularly near schools, can go a long way to making our roads and communities safer. Indeed, some of the key findings of the most recent Northern Ireland Continuous Household Survey indicated that the majority of respondents, 53%, thought that a 20 mile per hour speed limit should be more widely used, with 82% of respondents believing a 20 mile per hour speed limit should be applied outside schools, and three quarters thinking it should also be applied to an area where children play. My department is currently trialling an arrangement of signs that is intended to allow the introduction of more part-time 20 mile per hour limits at schools. The trial has been underway since September 2018 and my officials are currently <laughs> drafting a report on the findings of their review. I am expecting receipt of the findings of the trials in the next month or so and I fully intend to see what potential there is to build on the work already undertaken. I thank the Minister for her answer. Given um, the anecdotal evidence that you pointed to there and the, the expectation that you have your findings within a month, can we expect to see this part-time time signage implemented across all schools in the north that are currently on, on national speed limit um, roads, particularly given the, the safety concerns of, of those schools? Uh, and I thank the, the member for her supplementary question. Um, what the trial is doing, it's basically analysing uh, the effectiveness of the science and it's also looking to see is there a more economical way of introducing signage that would allow us to extend the rollout even further. It is something that I would be very keen to see. I know it's members of the public want to see and certainly members right across this house. So as soon as I assess that and take cognizance of the budget that I have, I would be keen to see it rolled out to many more schools. I call on Trevor Clark for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? Um, I'm sure the Minister is aware that some schools are coming up with their own imaginative ideas in terms of school courts and in conjunction with PSNI and bringing some of those speeders in. Some of those speeders, Minister, I'm sure you're aware, are within the 30 mile hour limits. So this, uh, this rollout or this uh, pilot scheme has been running for almost 18 months. Um, would the Minister not share the frustration of others that this is a long period of time to get to the conclusion of what many of us would seem as actually a very common sense approach? Uh, I thank the member uh, for his question. Yes, uh, I think this is one of many areas where we perhaps aren't as progressed as we would like, and I think a lot of that has to do with having no assembly and executive in place to drive these things forward. What I'm conscious of is that I've asked officials to bring to me the findings of that review. I think that the 20 mile per hour is certainly a good bit of the answer, but like you, I agree that there are many initiatives that are taking place within our schools. I think of the cycling proficiency scheme, the active school trial travel programme uh, that my department funds with the PHA and it's rolled out by Sustrans, uh, the learning resources that we apply in schools and the engagement with the PSNI that you have referenced. I think if we could bring all of those things together then we can absolutely enhance uh, the safety of children at schools and I think that's something that we would all like to work towards and would like to see happening. I call Michelle McElveen. Thank the Minister for her, question, her answer so far. Um, but while signage is clearly important, and I'll continue to lobby for signage in my own area, to affect real behavioural change, um, we do need to change um, uh, or, and be much more effective in having visible detection uh, and enforcement. Um, by doing that, we need to have our, our police on the ground. What discussions has the Minister had with the Chief Constable around road safety? The Chief Constable, because uh, as a Minister for Road Safety, I take my responsibilities in this regard very seriously. Uh, I'll be meeting with him uh, in just a couple of weeks, and among the items that we will discuss will be the issues around detection. I want to have a discussion with him about drink driving, drug driving uh, as well. So keen to work with all partners, uh, including the Chief Constable and the PSNI, uh, towards making our roads much safer. I call Philip O'Guigan. 
Oh, good. Uh, Ken Collier, uh, I welcome uh, the, the Minister's commitment to additional signage and, and, and indeed to uh, road safety. And the Minister may have seen alarming dash cam footage over the weekend of a tourist travelling for a number of minutes along the North Antrim coast on the wrong side of the road. Uh, and in light of that and other accidents within my own constituency, can I ask the Minister if she intends to uh, place signage at tourist areas, alerting drivers to drive in the left lane, as is the case in the south? I haven't seen the footage that the, the member refers to, um, but I'm keen to work with local councils um, and to put in improved signage to enhance road safety where and when it is needed. I'm also very mindful that the road safety strategy uh, runs out in December of this year. I've already asked officials to start bringing me information because I want to make informed choices so that we can have an effective road safety strategy with a number of actions that are deliverable but also can actually bring about a real change uh, in terms terms of road safety, and for that I mean issues like signage, uh, right up to looking at perhaps legislative change and changes around penalties um, for very, very dangerous driving. So want to take that very comprehensive and holistic approach. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker, um, and I want to thank the Minister for taking road safety so importantly, and I welcome your commitment to be a road safety champion. Um, I just would like to ask the Minister, uh, will she prioritise the reform of policy application with, with uh, regard to requiring statistics of accidents and injuries before change can be made on uh, main arterial routes? Thank you. Yes, I'm happy to look at that and certainly I can add it as an agenda item in terms of my engagement with the Chief Constable and also happy to follow up with the member afterwards if there's particular issues and aspects or solutions that you want to bring to my attention and for me to try to progress. I call Jocelyn McNulty. Um, I applaud the Minister in her efforts to improve road safety for all road users. And would the Minister join me and sending condolences to the families from my own constituency, the Faxon family, who a mother and son lost their lives tragically, and the McGill family, who so, 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 so tragically bereaved at the weekend. Uh, I completely send my uh, condolences and my thoughts to the families uh, of those who so tragically lost their lives uh, on our roads this weekend, and to all families who have lost uh, loved ones in this tragic way. Uh, just immediately upon uh, taking up office, I had the, the privilege to meet uh, Mr and Mrs Heaney, whose son Carl tragically lost his life uh, on the A1, once again struck by the dignity of these families who have suffered horrendously and yet strive with such compassion and with such energy through their pain to prevent any other family going through uh, what they have. What they have. Uh, that's why, for me, road safety uh, is not just a, a priority on paper. It is actually something that I want to work hard at to try to make a difference. Moving on, I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question two. I thank the member for his question. Uh, the member may be aware that in 2014 the EU Commission published an EU directive which set out the standards for roadworthiness testing across the European Union. This included a number of compulsory provisions which had implications for motor vehicle testing across the UK. As part of this directive, member states were authorised to exempt vehicles of historical interest from roadworthiness testing if they are at least 30 years old no longer in production and have not had substantial changes made to them. Before this, across the UK, only vehicles manufactured before 1960 were exempt from periodic testing. In 2018, Great Britain, following a public consultation, introduced an exemption for vehicles which were manufactured or first registered not less than 40 years ago. This has led to a difference as to how vehicles of historic interest are treated in GB and here in Northern Ireland. My department ran a consultation exercise in 2019, seeking views on whether the exemption should be introduced here, and I will be considering all aspects of this issue, including the consultation responses, to help me decide how best to proceed. 
It is clear, given the volume of correspondence my department has received recently from political representatives and historic car enthusiasts, that there is significant support to see a similar exemption here, as was introduced in GB in 2018. I am also aware of your particular passion uh, on the subject, and you are a strong advocate for change. So I want to reassure you that I will be examining this issue closely, and I hope to be in a position to update members relatively soon. Harry Harvey, supplementary. Thank you. Can I firstly thank the Minister for her answer and also for the correspondence and conversations that we have had to date. With us now having the Minister in place and assuming you have looked at this scheme and have given consideration to the completed consultation, would you now please advise the House of your timeline uh, to implement this scheme, knowing the benefits of it? Thank you. As I said to the member, I am currently going through all of the consultation responses, and I am very mindful that the majority of them were supportive of change, uh, as many members in this House are. Uh, members will be aware of the ongoing situation in our MOT centres, uh, and that I have said that we need to be improving our MOT system. Uh, I am very mindful uh, that in doing that, I should be taking cognizance of this issue. So while I can't give the member a definitive time frame on this, I do want to reassure him that I am actively considering it, and I want to be able to bring forward uh, proposals to this House as soon as possible. Also very happy to meet the member uh, and other uh, enthusiasts that he wishes to bring with him. Call to Lord Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I have no doubt the Minister will have swift action on that particular issue uh, as she has uh, uh, displayed in relation to getting our lifts orders for MOT centres. And I would also want to uh, commend the Minister who has been able to keep drivers on the road through her TECs. But I would ask the Minister whether or not she is considering biannual testing, as is the case in the Republic of Ireland. I thank the member for a question and her, her long list of compliments, sir, through the indulgence of the speaker. Um, yes, I, I do want to consider all options and how best to deliver vehicle testing services. Uh, no decisions have been taken, however, I am looking very closely at, at this option. I call Sean Lynch. The, can call you. the Minister answered my uh, question, which was in regard to timeline. I think she had no timeline at this stage. So come out. Well done. Okay, Andrew Muir. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the minister for her response and action in relation to this will help the MOT situation. The MOT situation that Northern Ireland has endured over the last number of weeks has been nothing short of a debacle. And I just want to ask the minister whether she is prepared to ensure that all reports, all investigatory and all audit reports are fully uh, published so the public can understand like, what exactly happened. I thank the member for his question. Um, I was very clear uh, when I became aware of the scale of the MOT situation that I made four commitments to the public, uh, that I would ensure the safety of DVA staff and customers, that I would do what I can to minimise the disruption to customers, um, that I would carry out uh, two or conduct two independent reviews to understand what happened and to best advise me going forward on how to get our MOT centres back and fully operable and safely operable as quickly as possible. And then it was to look at what we could do to make sure that this situation never happens again. The first of the independent reports was conducted by external independent engineers. The executive summary of that is on my department's website. The second independent review is an audit one. That's to help me understand what happened, who knew what, when, and what action was taken. Uh, that is being completed uh, at the moment. Uh, once it is completed, I again will be publishing that on my departmental website. I think it's very uh, important that as ministers, we have full openness uh, and transparency, uh, and that we very clearly set out how we arose of this situation, but what steps we are putting in place to make sure that it is never allowed to reoccur. And moving on, I call Sinead Bradley. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. Um, since taking up my post, I have made it clear that modern and sustainable water, drainage and transport infrastructure are key enablers to ensuring regionally balanced growth, improved connectivity and improved well-being for all. The projects highlighted within the new decade new approach agreement will be transformational and I intend to progress each of them as far as possible within my two-year tenure. However, in doing so, I must be mindful of the immediate need to significantly invest in our wastewater, public transport and road infrastructure, which have suffered from a legacy of years of underinvestment. 
These are the building blocks that need to be in place if we are to take forward the Executive's wider commitments on health, housing, the economy and climate change. The extent to which I can progress these important projects is, to a large extent, in the hands of the UK Government and the Executive's budget. To that end, I have met with Minister Robin Walker and had a positive, helpful conversation with the Secretary uh, of State for Transport. Uh, this is in addition to several representations to our own Finance Minister. Throughout of all these engagements, I have sought reassurance as to the priority of investment in our critical infrastructure. I am hopeful that the UK Government steps up to its responsibility and commits the necessary funding required for the delivery of the new Decade New Approach Agreement. I also hope that my executive colleagues realise the need to show the public that we can deliver in this place and they can help me secure the funding required to invest in our critical infrastructure that will allow us to meet our ambitions collectively, delivering for people right across Northern Ireland. Sinead Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response so far. Would the Minister recognise that a key critical piece of infrastructure for the South Down constituency is finally the delivery of Narrow Water Bridge? And would she commit to coming to visit the Narrow Water Bridge Community Network and myself, who are eager to, sh to see this project delivered as soon as possible? I thank the member for her supplementary question. Uh, I certainly recognise the local support for a bridge at Narrow Water to link the communities on both sides of the lock and to take full advantage of the tourism potential in this cross-border cross area. I thank the member for her invitation and I can confirm that following her request I will be coming to Southdown on the 18th of March and I would be delighted to meet with her and members of the Narrow Water Bridge Community Network to discuss the progression of Narrow Water Bridge. I know that the member has been advocating for her community for some time and that she is determined to see progress. Um, once I'm keen to discuss this project with the incoming Minister for Transport, Tourism and Sport, and I'm also keen to continue engaging with local communities uh, as we firm up a proposal. It's very important to me that I fulfil my commitment to addressing regional imbalance, and it is important that as an executive we deliver for the people of South Down. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. Will the Minister give us a commitment that she will make a priority the maintenance of her roads within the forthcoming year, which has been an ongoing issue, especially in, re in relation to uh, resurfacing, weight control, and, and, light, and street lighting? And I would also extend my thanks to the Minister for her efforts to restore the 12,000. Lights that have been out across the province, work which is now in progress. I understand contractors have now been tasked with getting on with the job. I, I thank the member for his question. Um, look, I firmly believe that if we don't get the basics right as an executive, if we don't show that we can make a change in people's lives um, and their daily lives from uh, fixing our potholes to switching back on our streetlights, then we can't genuinely and um, with any validity ask them to have confidence in us to deliver on the strategic visionary projects that we're all committed to. So I want to say that going forward, I've been making representations that yes, we need to get the big visionary stuff right, but I also need to be able to maintain and keep investing in our public assets. That means our roads, that means our streetlights, uh, and I'm keen to work with executive colleagues to make that happen. I call Rosemary Barton. We, we have an inadequate infrastructure maintenance budget for roads and street lighting and sufficient funds to provide sewage system to meet demand at the moment. And of course, public transport, you know, is also under stress. Would you accept that it is irresponsible politicians to make flagship cap capital commitments whilst failing to ensure the basic infrastructure needs are not addressed? I think that what we have to do is we have to absolutely have ambition to be delivered on flagship projects that will transform lives, that will tackle regional imbalance, that will tackle the climate emergency. But as I've said, we also need to do the, what people consider the basic things right. What I'm keen to do, and I've made a number of representations to the Finance Minister, is to see that I can get the right resource budget and the right capital budget to be able to do both. 
I'm looking forward to the 11th of March to Westminster because we hear a lot from this British government and the Prime Minister in particular about turbocharging infrastructure uh, uh, across the water. There's reference to turbocharging infrastructure in the new DECA new approach agreement which the British government has signed. I know there are many projects uh, that I could be investing in uh, right from uh, maintenance of our street of our roads uh, to investing in our public transport network, really modernising it. Um, so I look forward to looking at the Barnet, Barnet consequentials that come across and, and trying to do all of those things to make a difference to people's lives. I call Colm Gilder uh, Will the Minister acknowledge that the projects identified in the New Decade New Approach do not represent an exhaustive list of the Department's priorities, as it should also strive to progress other vital projects, such as the A4 Southern Bypass, and upgrades to the A32 Omid and Skillen Road? I do recognise the very strong local support for a number of roads projects and the many benefits that they can bring. Ideally, I would like to be able to do all of those things, but I have to operate within the practicalities uh, and the realism uh, of a budget. I would uh, encourage the member to make as many positive representations to the Minister of Finance as possible to help me uh, deliver on many of the projects that he has cited, because he's right. Um, in the new decade, new approach, there is a very ambitious programme in terms of infrastructure, um, but there are many other projects that are maybe not seen to be flagship, but really could make a difference in communities' lives, particularly connecting them and addressing years of historical uh, neglect. So keen to work with the Finance Minister and with all executive colleagues uh, as we deliver on our programme for government. And moving on, a call on Palm Cameron. My department has delivered an additional 3,400 bus and rail park and ride spaces across Northern Ireland. These have proven highly attractive and played a central role in the growth of passenger numbers on our rail services. In October 2018, my department approved a business case for an additional 235 spaces at Mosley West. However, following a request from Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council, it became necessary to review that plan in order to incorporate links to the Council's Greenway strategy. While that has delayed the project, it should ensure a facility which better meets the needs not only of those driving to our park and ride sites, but also for those walking and cycling. It is exactly this more holistic and joined up approach I believe is essential if we are to encourage and enable more people to travel sustainably. The revised plans for Mosley West are now well advanced and the land purchase is due to be completed by the 31st of March. However, while I recognise the importance of park and ride, the fact is that severe constraints in my budget departments over recent years has resulted in significant pressures across my department. I have already stressed the need for investment in infrastructure to my executive colleagues and as a member will be aware, infrastructure is key to connecting our communities and it is the bedrock on which we should build our ambitions for delivery of radical change to improve lives. Supplementary, Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer um, so far. And I know the Minister will be aware of the very serious parking issues around the Mossy West area. Uh, the, in the glade on, of Mosley, and it's been like this for many, many years. Uh, such the extent of the problem is uh, so much that there are even uh, pensioners' bungalows which are not really accessible by even emergency services. So there is a real issue around uh, parking and access to these homes. Um, very much welcome the additional parking spaces which have been lobbying for for many years. So that's uh, very welcome news. Could I ask the minister if? she would agree to come and visit the area and see for herself and also to um, take into account that any proposal coming through planning um, may actually have a very detrimental effect on the residents and uh, cause further congestion in terms of traffic given that the route is also um, a bus route. Uh, thank the member for supplementary questions. Um, it is my understanding that following representations from local councillors and MLAs, waiting restrictions were introduced in the immediate vicinity of Mosley West Station in 2016. 
um, that this was the purpose of this was to discourage all day parking by uh, commuters and hopefully improve um, access for residents. Um, I wasn't aware that there are continued um, significant issues with it, so I am happy to take the, the member up on her invitation uh, and to come out and see for myself and to meet with some of the residents. On the planning issue, uh, I suspect that the planning application will go through the local council, um, so I would encourage the member to, to keep an eye on that and hopefully any issues can be resolved there. I call Martina Anderson. Minister, Minister, given that additional car parking and parking spaces is an issue for many across the north, and I want to talk primarily about the train station in Derry and the Northwest Transportation Hub Phase 2. Now, I know you have limitations in terms of your budget. We all know that there's $600 million of a hole because of British cuts in the executive budget. But notwithstanding that, as a minister, you will prioritise. So will you prioritise the train station in Derry for the Phase 2 of the Northwest Transportation Hub that has to be completed by the summer of this year? One of my priorities um, is around tackling climate change. I've been very clear that I believe that investing in our public transport network is key to that. I'm also on record as saying that I believe that our rail network has been underestimated and underinvested in. Uh, I've also said about the need to tackle regional imbalance, so I very much see rail projects in the North West as, as hitting a number of those ministerial priorities. Uh, I'm keen to get down to the North West, uh, to engage with local communities uh, and to see for myself. Uh, so certainly want to try to do what I can within the two years and within the budget, but to reassure the member that for all of the priorities that I've set out, I do recognise the importance of this and want to do what I can. I call Steve Egan. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Minister, for your interest. I must declare in an interest here as the Vice President of Mossley Hockey Club. And I would like her department to ensure that the, in the expansion of Mossley Halt, a full consultation is carried out with the community, including with the hockey club, on how traffic management is conducted, and while expanding this great facility, how disruption to a long-suffering community is diminished. And I'd also be delighted, along with uh, Pam, to extend an invitation for you to come and visit both our club and our electric charging unit at the railway station, which you can plug that into. But it would be better if you came by train. Thank you, Minister. I'm happy to take the, the member up um, on, his, on his invitation when I'm out uh, in that direction. Uh, happy to meet with the hockey club uh, and to say that, of course, uh, if TransLink and bringing forward this, this plan and proposal should absolutely engage with the local community, uh, should be involved in the local community so that we're getting to a solution uh, that meets most people's, if not everyone's, needs in the area. I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can, I, can I also thank the Minister for the answers given in relation to this additional, additional provision in my constituency? And thank her too for her reference to sustainable transport. And, and I would ask, therefore, um, is this not the ideal opportunity to start looking at expanding our railway provision where that is achievable and in turn sustainable, like for example the Knockmore line to serve Crumlin in South Antrim and also the International Airport. Thank the member um, for his question. I am very much aware of the interest in rail generally, but also in, in the particular lines and routes that, that you have referenced. Uh, again, this comes down to Am I prioritising public transport? Yes. Do I see the huge potential within our rail network, not just in terms of tackling the climate emergency, but also as a tourism offering? Um, absolutely. And if we're serious about the modal shift of getting people out of their cars, then we need to recognise that having a vibrant rail network is key to that. But as with all of these things, um, the reality of having to operate within a budget, which I have not caught sight of yet, but will hopefully be, have a clearer picture in a few weeks' time, will necessitate that within that I have to make um, priorities and will have to make uh, difficult choices. What I am committing to members is that um, when I'm looking at our public transport network, I see it as, as about connecting people, as about tackling the climate emergency, tackling regional imbalance, and so I genuinely want to do what I can to be pushing that agenda forward. I call Sinead Ennis. I get can call you. Um, Kesht Ever Al -Kug. Uh, thank the member uh, for her question. In the New Decade New Approach deal, the UK Government committed to providing additional financial support for infrastructure delivery to enable the Executive to invest in a range of potential capital projects such as Narrow Water Bridge. 
As I stated earlier, I have met with Minister Walker and our Finance Minister to discuss the issues we face here and to seek reassurance as to the priority of investment in our critical infrastructure. The Irish Government also stated its readiness to progress jointly consideration of options for the development of the Narrowater Bridge project at the North-South Ministerial Council. As previously stated to Ms Bradley, uh, I recognise the local support for a bridge at Narrowater to link the communities on both sides of the lock and maximise the tourism potential of this cross-border region, whilst also protecting the natural environment in this area of great historic and ecological significance. I will be pressing to ensure that we can unlock the tourism potential of this cross-border region and I look forward to engaging with my counterpart in the South to discuss how best to achieve this in the newry Carlingford area. That ends the period for a list of questions and I move to topical questions and I call Mr Sean Lynch. I can call you. Minister, there is an area in my own constituency called Bow which continually floods during bad weather. What uh, plans does the Minister have to address this issue? Um, I thank the member uh, for his question. Um, flooding in the Bow area of County Fermanagh usually occurs when water levels uh, in the river there rise after prolonged and heavy rainfall. Officials have in the past considered a flood alleviation scheme for this area that would involve the diversion of the river and improve the gradient in this flat and slow flowing river. Unfortunately, the costs of this proposal far outweigh any benefits in terms of flood alleviation that would be gained. However, my department has established a community resilience group in the Bow area to help residents be more resilient to the impacts of flooding. Officials have also developed strong links with other response organisations and the voluntary sector to provide coordinated multi-agency support to individual properties or communities that may be cut off by flood water and require access to essential services. I call Sean Lynch for supplementary. Uh, I want to thank the Minister for her uh, extensive answer. Does the Minister understand the impact it's having on day-to-day -day lives, particularly care workers? I do indeed uh, recognise the importance of that and there has been multi-agency coordination ongoing at, at a local level um, as recently there as, as Friday the 20th of February uh, in relation to the impacts to residents. Um, a watching brief is ongoing and further calls will be held as required with participants from right across uh, a number of sectors and partners. Uh, the member will know this because he has been advocating on this issue that Fermanagh and Oma District Council have initiated a welfare assistance line. Um, to advise that if there are instances where a carer is unable to access a client's home, they should contact their social worker. I am advised that no calls have been received to date to this help helpline, but I am very conscious of the impact on carers. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that uh, in recent weeks I have been lobbying her in respect to um, the possibility of introducing legislation that would prohibit uh, vehicles from passing stationary school uh, buses from children are getting on and off. And since uh, I lobbied her in respect, that I have been contacted by teachers from as far away as United Arab Emirates and the United States and Canada, where such legislation is in place, and I've been contacted by school pass, uh, control, passing school control attendant for uh, enable children to get across the road, welcoming us. So, well, has she given any further consideration to introducing such legislation? I thank the member for his question and yes the member has written to me um, on a couple of occasions on this very matter and he has been examining best practice from across the globe on it and has been sharing that with me and that's very helpful and I also understand the importance of this to you. Uh, I understand that uh, it almost affected your two children so it is an issue that matters to us as parents and also as elected representatives and I can understand why schools are getting in touch with you on it. Um, I am reviewing the best practice that, that you have shared with me and you will be aware of the number of road safety teaching resources that we apply to schools and we spoke earlier about the reduction in speed limits and so forth around schools. I suppose it's looking to see what more we can do on that and I am intending to review the range of pressures across my department and will be considering my legislative programme accordingly. Uh, I want to consider a whole range uh, of proposals to see what I, is doable within these two years, but I would be keen to continue engagement with the member on this issue. Dagna Magalier, supplementary. 
Uh, thank the Minister for uh, her, her response there. And I think earlier on, uh, during the question time, it was, the point was made that we need to take steps here that can improve people's lives. And I just think that this will be one step, at very minimum, certainly capital cost, that could be, would be very important. Uh, I want to just ask the Minister, um, has she had any correspondence or communication with the Minister for Education, or is she planning to have any communication with the Minister for Education in respect of such proposed legislation? Uh, to reassure the member, yes, uh, I, I haven't had engagement with the Education Minister as yet, but I will be engaging with the Minister for Education and other ministerial colleagues as I start to formulate the road safety strategy. Um, this is an area that I would like to see and consider uh, as part of that. So, as well as engaging with members, I can reassure him I will be engaging with the Education Minister on it. I call Cahill Boylan. Can Coyle, could I thank the Minister for answers thus far? Just in relation to gas and oil exploration, has the Minister or does she intend to make a decision soon for the removal of um, permitted development rights for gas and oil? Uh, thank you, the Member for this uh, very important question. Um, this is uh, an area of policy that has been impacted on um, because we haven't had an Assembly or a Minister in place. Um, uh, in June 2016, in response to a motion calling for the protection of Woodburn Forest, the then Minister, um, Mark H. Durkin, announced uh, the intention to remove permitted development rights for petroleum exploration and to consult upon proposals for legislative change. In December 2016, the public consultation, which was informed by responses received in an earlier call for evidence, proposed a number of options. I want to reassure the member that I will be considering the responses to the consultation over the coming weeks. Carol Boylan, supplementary. Yeah, I thank you, Kian Coyle, and thank the Minister for answer. Could the Minister outline how many sites are currently operating under permitted development rights at the minute? Thank you. I don't have that information to hand, but what I will do is I will follow up in writing to confirm the number of sites with the member. I call Paul Frew. The Minister may or may not be aware at this stage of her, her premiership uh, that, her ministership, that the A26 uh, road, uh, and especially the junction at Wood Green, has blighted the lives of many uh, with deaths and serious injury uh, due to road traffic accidents. There had been work done on a stretch of road down, uh, further down towards Bellamina at the Carnats Junction, or the Crumkell Junction, sorry. Has the member had time to look and assess uh, the success of that junction work, and is that something that could be replicated then in the Wood Green Junction? I thank the member for his question. Um, a new regional strategic transport network transport plan, as it's very uh, succinctly known, is being developed by my officials, and that will include proposals for future road improvement schemes. And I'll be considering that in due course, um, along with the other competing priorities. In particular, um, to the road referred to and the junction, what I would be keen to do is to have my officials meet with you on site, and then they can feed back to me uh, further information on it. Paul for uh, That would be very helpful, Minister. I thank you for that commitment, and I will uh, contact the, uh, your staff uh, on that. Uh, there was plans to implement junction work at the Wood Green Junction, uh, but it, it, it didn't go forward because of challenges, legal challenges, or, or what challenges that could have went legal. Uh, can the Minister assure us that whatever is implemented or whatever is proposed to be implemented will be robust enough uh, in order to be successful? Uh, I absolutely uh, support and defend people's right to challenge. Um, I do think, though, we need to be making sure that when we are completing all of the strategy processes in terms of road schemes or junction work, uh, that we make sure that everything is carried out as robustly as possible so that the decision-making uh, process is robust uh, and that then we can then get to a point where we're able to progress schemes. So it is something that, as Minister, I'm mindful of. I think it's something that, as an executive, uh, we're mindful of. So just to reassure him that there is thinking going on within the department in respect of those issues. And I'm very clear that we need to make sure that all statutory processes, all due processes, are always completed to the highest of standards to help protect against that. I call on William Humphreys. Answer so far. I understand, Minister, that the business case for the extension of the glider from 
to include South Belfast and North Belfast uh, will be submitted in the spring. Can I ask the Minister when consultation will begin to allow the purple gliders to be extended across our constituency, other than when they are coming or going to their uh, station? Uh, I know that there are many in North Belfast that are frustrated at the lack of progress in terms of the extension uh, of the glider. The member is correct that as part of the um, Belfast Regional City deal, um, the gliders are being progressed. There is a uh, business case being submitted, as he says, in the spring. What I'm keen to do is to move to public consultation in the latter part uh, of this year. Uh, that's where we can then uh, scrutinise a potential route to make sure that we get uh, the right decision. But to reassure him that, again, as I've said, public transport uh, is important, connectivity uh, is important, and there are not many constituencies that are as fragmented as North Belfast. We need to work together to change that. Supplementary, William Humphrey. Thank you very much. Uh, given that con connectivity is important, and the Minister mentioned earlier in an earlier answer the issue of tourism, over the weekend I visited the great city of Glasgow. The Minister will be aware of the difficulty there is in terms of road connections between the ports of Stranraer and, and Kern Ryan to Glasgow, and how that impacts on football supporters, travel, tourism and trade. Can I ask the Minister, has she planned or has she met with her Scottish equivalent to uh, address these issues, which are so important to Northern Ireland PLC? I have engaged with my Scottish counterpart. Um, we have begun a discussion on a number of areas, and I would actually am um, looking forward to meeting him uh, in the not too distant future uh, to discuss a range of shared concerns and also uh, a, a number of areas where we can work together. Uh, keen to add this item to our agenda when we meet. I call on Pat Catnett. I want to thank the Minister for coming and answering the questions today. Minister, can I ask you for an update uh, just uh, at the bottom end of Moyer on the Station Road uh, on the car park there, which is proposed? I know it's been ongoing for a while, and I just know that it's still not complete. I just wonder if you'd be able to give me an update, Minister. Uh, I thank the member for his question. Um, yes, the first business case to build a new park and ride facility at Moira Station was approved by my department in June 2016, but this could not proceed as negotiations to procure the land were unsuccessful. A new process was therefore undertaken and a new business case identifying a new site was received in October 2019. It is anticipated this scheme will produce an additional 340 spaces when complete. However, the procurement process to appoint a main contractor cannot commence until full funding is secured, planning approval is obtained and the lands acquired. TransLink is preparing a full business case for the project and once the land purchase has been finalised, it will be submitted to my department for approval. I will be considering this in line with the budget uh, and a number of competing priorities. Pat Catney, supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for a response. And Minister, just at the bottom of Moira, for about three quarters of a mile to the station, along the station road, there's no lighting. And I was wondering if the Minister could give a, an update maybe on, on lighting for that stretch of road. I am aware uh, of the concerns of the lack of lighting along the stretch that the member has referred to. I think the difficulty here is that the criteria that's been set and that I have inherited around rural lighting is very clear. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this stretch does not seem to qualify uh, for that, but I'm keen to further engage with the member uh, to see if there are other things that we could be doing to try to find a resolution to this. I do hope that we get to a point where we are able to progress um, the extension of the park and ride there. Um, hopefully that will take some of the pressure off and actually ease the lighting issue in terms of the park parking congestion as well. I call on Catherine Kelly. Minister, during the recent flooding um, from Storm Kira, an interagency tactical response team was present on the day of the flooding, and it included fire service, PSNA, DFA roads, Rivers Agency and other relevant agencies. It was very effective as they were able to have a coordinated approach to the flooding. What is your department's future plans to fund um, something like this essential interagency approach into the future so that they are more efficient, they are more efficient in terms of long-term planning? 
I thank the member for a question and I want to put on record my appreciation and thanks to the staff from my department and from all of those agencies that have worked together uh, and worked tirelessly uh, because there have been relentless uh, issues around flooding and storms for the past four or five weeks. Uh, my department is the lead on this work and works very uh, well with other agencies. That's something that I want to see continued, uh, whether it's flooding or uh, uh, gully cleaning or the preventative work, it will only work if we all work in partnership. So I want to play my part uh, in terms of my department facilitating that, uh, encouraging and promoting that partnership working right across the board with all stakeholders. Catherine Cal Calais, supplementary. Thank you for your answer, Minister. Do you agree that we need to fund best practice models for dealing with flood risk to minimise the harm these adverse weather events have on our communities? Yes, I think that partnership working uh, is key. The pooling of resource uh, to try to deal with this is key. And so keen uh, for my department to play its part working with other stakeholders. Well, question time is now up and uh, the next order, next item will be a statement from the Minister uh, of Health on the emergence of the coronavirus. But it could ask